Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to each of you. And thank you for joining us today for this virtual event on unleashing the power of AI for business transformation. I hope all of you are doing well and keeping safe. My name is Vijay Taripalli, and I'm excited to be your host today. What does the future of AI look like? Why do enterprises need to think of AI as a key strategy pillar and a means of competitive differentiation? Is there a framework for a comprehensive approach to scale AI adoption and on how to drive innovation? Today, we are joined by three esteemed thought leaders on the topic of unleashing the power of AI for business transformation. Yugal Joshi, Partner Everest Group, Nidhi Srivastava, Vice President and Global Head, Google Business Unit TCS, Scott Penberthy, Office of the CTO, Google Cloud. Before we begin, let's take a quick look at this virtual event platform. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a row of widget icons. These control the various windows, which are resizable and movable by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. Feel free to move them around to get the most of your desktop. For better experience, during this panel discussion, you may want to maximize the video media window to full screen. We will be answering your questions as part of the Q&A session after the panel discussion. Do use the Q&A box below to submit your queries. Without further ado, let's welcome our panelists. Our first panelist today is Yugal Joshi. Yugal Joshi is Everest Group's business leader for technology services, research and advisory memberships. Yugal has helped leading buyers and providers of technology solutions and services in technology adoption strategy, assessment of key market trends, go-to-market strategy, competitive insights, market positioning, and expected future roadmap. He regularly interacts with industry leaders and drives thought leadership on core technology and technology services. Yugal's articles and commentary are regularly included in leading business news and technology media. And he regularly cont contributes to Everest Group's blog. Hi, Yugal. Hey, Vijay, hi. Thanks much for inviting me to this very interesting and um, engaging panel. I think we are going to discuss a very important and pertinent topic, and I'm looking forward to it. So true. A very warm welcome to you, Yugal. Our next panelist is Nidhi Srivastava. Nidhi is TCS's Vice President and Global Head, Google Business, Google Cloud Business. She leads the company's Google Cloud Business Unit, which is a full stack unit for cloud services. She guides companies to accelerate value from their cloud transformations and provides strategic guidance for enterprise cloud transformation, helping companies achieve agility, efficiency, and scale. Hello, Nidhi. Hello, Vijay. Um... It's uh, wonderful to be here together uh, this morning. I'm uh, uh, calling in from Chicago and uh, I'm looking forward to a very vibrant discussion uh, with uh, Yugal and Scott. So it's wonderful to be here. Excited. A very warm welcome to you, Nidhi. Thank Our you. next panelist is Scott Penberthy. Uh, Scott has demonstrated efficacy in reverse engineering, mainframe systems and healthcare claims processing searching for exoplanets and minerals on the moon with NASA, and cutting the costs in millions of customer chat and voice interactions. Scott has blessed with, was blessed with the opportunity to build an amazing AI team without, within the CTO office, where the team instigated call center AI, document AI, AI notebooks, and many of Google's largest AI cloud teams. Scott holds a PhD in AI with multiple degrees from MIT, and the University of Washington. Hello, Scott. Good morning, Vijay, and how are you? And thanks everyone for spending a few minutes with us today. Um, I'm experiencing RTO, return to office. So I'm here in Chicago, and if the lights go out and I do this, it's because it's a sustainable office. And so anyway, I'm looking forward to having a chat this morning and uh, really excited about uh, spending some time with you all today. Lovely. A warm welcome to you, Scott. A very warm welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us today. My first question is for Yugal from Everest. Yugal, uh, as a business leader for technology services, research and advisory, how do you see enterprises adopt AI and ML? And how are they weaving it into their core businesses? 
your thoughts, please. Yeah, so I think in our work with enterprises or, or speaking with them, one thing is very clear that everybody wants to do something with AI. So we found out in one of our research that more than 72% of enterprises have embarked on their AI journey. So they are doing something with it. And I'm not really surprised with this number because you know the, the potential of AI is huge. And this tells you that people get it, that, that yes, AI is extremely relevant for their business, for their uh, future transformation. Having said that, uh, the concerning thing for me in this research was that less than 10% of these enterprises said that they have meaningful AI running in production. Because what they are doing is given the promise of AI, they are running too many POCs, running in multiple directions, just, just we're trying and testing, okay, this may work, this may not work. So a lot of POCs are happening, a lot of ad hoc, ad hoc adoption is going on, but then a thoughtful implementation is still lacking. Which means very few enterprises, if at all anybody, have really cracked the code of, okay, how do you use AI in, in your business transformation? And eventually all of them realize that irrespective of the fact that today they may not be a mature adopter, but going forward at some point of time, they will need to industrialize their AI, AI adoption. And we do see that cloud playing such an important role because a lot of the things that did not work for AI adoption earlier are now uh, enabled by cloud platforms. So if you combine the power of cloud data and AI, this trinity is really helping enterprises to drive business transformation. And, and some of the capabilities that many cloud services provide almost you know, out of the box, uh, AI, ML, lot of APIs, now even low code, no code uh, uh, capabilities, enterprises can use them and then and then scale their, uh, scale their AI journey, eventually moving to an industrialization uh, of, of AI adoption. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for uh, Nidhi. Nidhi, as the head of a business and IT consulting firm, serving many large customers in a variety of industries. What is your perspective on scaling AI uh, to shape the future of business? Um, yeah, so um, I think uh, we have now moved uh, to the eternal spring of digital. And uh, um, it is uh, interesting to note that um, uh, COVID or the pandemic uh, pushed us into a digital age uh, at a breathtaking speed. We never imagined, I mean, I have to admit, and you can list here on the panel, I think uh, the analyst community, the consulting community, the thought leaders, the evangelists could not force the pace of digital the way uh, COVID did. So so that's real, and and it, it, is, uh, it, it is really, uh, eye-opening to note the speed and the pace at which human behaviors can adjust. So what I did see uh, during the course of the pandemic is that um, irrespective um, of age demographics, it, irrespective of uh, uh, the uh, development of uh, a country's economy, the response um, uh, at a human level was very much enabled by digital. So I've traveled to a few countries uh, in recent times and everywhere, as you go through various kinds of testing, the results are always delivered uh, electronically now. So the, coming back to your question, what do I see uh, you know, in terms of how AI will scale? I think the holy trinity that uh, Yugal spoke about, which is data cloud and AI, I think uh, this is going to continue to be uh, at the center of the digital universe because uh, you need good data to be able to train the uh, uh, algorithms. And, and, and the, uh, the, the key is finding that good data because we have a plethora of data, but there's a lot of data noise as well. So how do you get to the data that matters and then 
be able to find out the biases that are inherent in your data set today and make your AI explainable. To me, the explainability of AI and the trust that uh, machine learning will generate will drive in a big way the bold and the audacious use cases. We see AI everywhere. It's there on my phone, facial recognition, right? It is AI. But the question is, how boldly will we use AI to solve societal problems? I think that's where really the challenge lies in front of all of us. We have Scott uh, from Google Cloud. And, and uh, uh, cloud is a huge enabler right now in this journey uh, for AI adoption because cloud democratizes the use and the access of technologies. And Google has really been a leader on that front, both from the standpoint of open source thinking and providing platforms to people so that you can consume uh, AI and uh, drive change. And uh, last uh, but not the least, I will say uh, that um, uh, we, we need uh, a, a real sponsorship and commitment from the leaders of the businesses uh, in, in embracing AI. Uh, I think they have embraced cloud in a big way. I have personally been witness to um, how um, uh, um, COVID uh, catapulted you know, cloud adoption. And incidentally, both the words COVID and cloud start with a C and end with, with a D. That's just uncanny, I would say. But I do see that uh, trust, explainability, good data, and uh, democratization of technology are some of the key things that will try massive uh, uh, AI adoption. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nidhi. Uh, My next question is for Scott. Uh, Scott, given that the teams you built instigated many of Google's largest AI cloud uh, first cloud AI first cloud teams, sorry, what cloud what Google technologies do you see increasing in use as your customers transform their businesses? Your thoughts, Scott? You know, I think if you go back to what um, Nitty was saying, you know, Nitty, you, I spent the last five years trying to figure out we've got all this huge AI stack. You know, where is it useful? And if you look at COVID uh, nineteen. Um, where I've come to the conclusion is that there's a reason Marie Kondo's in business, right? And there it goes. Look at that. It's so funny. The light. <laughs> I do it. Um, but the reason Marie Kondo's in business is because humans are highly unstructured. You know, I don't know what your closet looks like, but I could use some help, right? So and Marie Kondo helps organize things. And if you look at any business, a lot of humans deal with data that's not in the database. You know, we, we talk to each other. Uh, we, we communicate via email. That's not structured. We send each other PDFs. If you're in a hospital, you fax things still, right? And a lot of the information we exchange in business is highly unstructured. And, um, and video now is becoming a first element of all business. You know, look at right now, we're all on video because we're some of us going back to the office, some are not. So we need a technology that allows us to scale processes and deal with that kind of information. And it turns out these AI techniques are perfect for that. And so what we're starting to see is where AI, even like the search engine itself, you say, well, how do you use deep learning? I see this question from Anon. If you do an image search, you're using deep learning. If you do, if you Google this morning, you're using deep learning, right? It's where these technologies are now coming in and where they're really helpful is they're allowing us to take processes and things you used to have to go through humans to deal with unstructured data. It's becoming the advisor to help you find the information you need at the, at the moment you need it and process it. Um, and, and you can take you know, unstructured data, video, text, language, speech, music, and then structure it and put it in traditional IT systems. So that's sort of the new role that I see of, of AI. And it's helping simple things of like, how do you answer the phone when a customer calls, right? And not put them on wait. Um, how, do you, how do you have a chat with a customer? How do you, how do you exchange by email? Machines now can help with that. So that's, that's where I really see a lot of traction coming. Wonderful. Thank you, Scott. Uh, here's a question for you, Nidhi. Uh, in your experience of helping customers navigate their AI adoption journey, what are the strategic and operational challenges that enterprises generally face? Nidhi? Um, good question, Vijay. Uh, there are uh, three things uh, that bubble up to the top. There are, of course, uh, as in um, any massive uh, uh, technology change that has been driven over the decades, 
uh, we, we, we see that uh, you, you go through the constraints and the challenges uh, and, and uh, how you d uh, address or attack them, you know, drives how adoption picks up. So today, if I look at what are the key things, first and foremost is lack of good data. There is tremendous amount of data, but uh, finding um, uh, the, the right data to train um, AI it continues to be uh, some, a, a challenge for organizations world over. Uh, and, um, uh, and at a certain level, the ability to uh, move data on cloud. In fact, right now, what I experience, uh, almost uh, um, every single one of our uh, clients, um, when I look at their cloud journey, the, the thing that they prioritize the most is moving data on the cloud. Uh, and uh, I, I know why they're doing it. They're doing it because in about uh, 12 or 18 months um, with the modernization, data modernization that they will do, they will have a good base, you know, to drive change in their businesses, change in their operating models using AI. Uh, for example, one of our uh, uh, grocery uh, change, large retailer uh, customer, uh, they moved to the cloud three years back. They, they are the, the pre-COVID cloud adopters, if you will. And today, they, the way they are driving the uh, product assortment mix in different stores, the number of what-if simulations they're able to do uh, ha ha has led to very significant uh, growth in their sales, even in COVID times, you know, where most of us were buying online and the, um, uh, you know, it's just like you have returned to office, there is a return to the store. Uh, also taking shape now. It's good. It's always good to see more cars and the shopping malls finally, you know, beginning to see footfalls. It's a positive thing, I would say. So the lack of data, uh, data uh, integration, that's one challenge. The second challenge that I, uh, uh, I'm going to speak about is something we are all experiencing, which is lack of good talent. So good data scientists, good machine learning specialists, very, very hard. We are living and experience and experiencing what uh, is being described as the wave of great resignation. You know, to to uh, I mean that's what everybody's talking about. The the the, the talent shortage is very real. Um, so I do see that a lack of uh, good talent also getting in the way, and uh, companies are doing different things. You know, to. Uh, um, deal with it, whether it is, um, uh, you know, looking at good uh, partners, companies that can provide the services to uh, developing talent in-house as well. So lack of talent. And the third thing that I will say is where we have to make more progress is uh, in terms of um, explainability. While, you know, uh, we, uh, we, we are... Uh, testing out uh, bold and audacious usage, uses of AI. For example, people are trusting robotic assisted surgery, okay? People are going uh, under the table, but uh, when I reflect, what I notice is that in that scenario, where it is a life and death scenario, it is AI being an extension of human intelligence because the surgeon is also there. <laughs> you know, you are not trusting your surgery to be done entirely by the robot. So I think that's why I've been asking myself, if a person can go on the operation theater table, why would I, as an individual, not trust putting my mother in a driverless car? I have asked myself this question. And I think that I, and I, I, I understood because, you know, in a driverless car, probably I will trust myself because I can take control, you know, when driving. But my mother cannot drive, and so I would hesitate putting her in a driverless car. So I think that the trust factor, but it will get better. Today, we get into airplanes without batting an eyelid. We don't even think, you know, because it, it has matured so much. I think we will get there uh, with AI uh, and, and driverless cars, too. So trust and explainability is the third challenge that I see. Wonderful. I recall the example of lifts when people were afraid of getting into a lift as to you know whether it will take them to the higher floor lower floor and lift itself was a challenge at one time it's difficult to imagine now 
but getting into lifts was a challenge in terms of uh, paradigm shift. Thank you, Nidhi. Over to you, Yugal. Uh, ethics in AI is an issue that is much talked about these days. What is your perspective on the topics of explainability and bias as AI becomes mainstream? Yugal? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you make a very valid statement that these are very talked about things. And the reason I am saying because they are mostly talked about. And the reason is currently enterprises are so so behind in the way they would want to adopt AI that ethics become a good discussion point, but rarely something people really strategically think about, which can which can hurt them going forward. And, and we have had public cases in, in specific industries with specific clients who have who struggled explaining to the industry, explaining to their clients, to the regulators, what, what did their AI system do? Now, ethics in general is a very complex topic, but from our, our vantage point, you know, you have a fairness factor to it that AI system needs to be fair. And then the trustworthiness of it, that that other systems and humans need to trust it. The point Nidhi also made that you, you may trust a robotic surgeon more than a driverless car. So those perceptions are there. But beyond this, there is one other element which Nidhi also touched upon, which is the entire explainability. And the reason I talked about fairness is, you know, if let's say somebody does a crime they can like, explain why they did it but that explanation doesn't validate the crime so explainability, explainability by itself isn't sufficient but it's a very important aspect of ai especially when when we are talking about ethical adoption uh nidhi also spoke about you know issues around data issues issues around biases and the way we build our models the way some of the algos are being built and more than that, the test data that is being used, a lot of it comes with uh, their own inherent biases. Now, it may not be representative of a sample set. And the reason is the people who are driving AI adoption have to show some progress. So many times they may end up cutting corners, which is a, which is a dangerous strategy. At least we never recommend our clients to do that. But it happens. Uh, so... So the bias around, it could be a representation bias, it could be a sampling bias, it could be another type of bias that is there. Plus the way AI models have become so complex and as you keep adding newer nodes, add you, as, you, as you keep adding newer functionalities and now, now people are also talking about a general purpose model where earlier AI models were normally built for a specific task. But now people say, okay, let's just try to build a general purpose model that can do uh, not only NLP, but something else as well. So things will become further complex. And as you add more complexity, explaining that model and algorithm is, is very, very difficult, almost next to impossible. And last but not the least is the risk associated with Nidhi, what also talked about, right? Uh, autonomous cars or, or anything for that matter. So if an AI system uh, takes a decision, who, who owns it? I mean, who needs to be held accountable for it? Uh, would the vendor be accountable who built that AI system? Or would, would the technology company where who are the building blocks of it or somebody else or the client? Who, who is going to be held accountable eventually? I think those gray areas are there. And all of this to us comes under an ethical adoption of AI that you use AI, A, where it needs to be used. Second, you use AI in a, in a fair manner and then create systems that are trustworthy. And to do that, you will really need a good data set. I think there is no escape to it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, research happening around how can you reduce the amount of data needed but I think data has to be representative of what you want to do. And then you will need to build some kind of call out the way we used to do in uh, application development or software development where you have an a traceability to something. So how do you build models that can trace, okay, I did this, 
because of these 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 many reasons because ai systems are not like uh, other system they can have for same input different output or dif or different input can produce the same output so they are lot more complex and when you combine it with the uh, data challenge when you combine with the security and the risk challenge i think ethics become extremely important and and something and enterprises need to think while they are trying to scale their ai journey otherwise it is going to cost them in the future thank you go and as you rightly said it's a very deep subject and is evolving and it will evolve through open debates uh, democratized debates thank you so much uh, you go let me now extract and by the way we have come halfway to our uh, uh, almost reaching the mid time for our uh, session so from a time response perspective i wanted to bring your attention to it let me now extract some some more pearls of wisdom from the panelists scott could you please share your perspective on a framework for ai led business transformation well and i have how many uh, hours do i have to answer that question <laughs> i guess you have plenty you you have plenty, have plenty, have plenty. Have plenty. Right. <laughs> take so it to me <laughs> I, I, let me go back to um maybe I contextualize this it might might help some people in the audience um i think you know nitty what you said earlier is spot on right there's how do you find the right data we we don't have the talent it's a great resignation and then how do you explain what's going on to your customer base right or or, or whoever else it is so those are situations that are acute we're all feeling it you know, you know favorite restaurants are closing down a lot of businesses are going out cuz they can't find the talent and so i think what we're going to see is a new dawn a golden age of innovation in business because they want to stay in business you got to pay for your kids go on education you know, you know johnny needs new shoes and you know we we have to prosper and i think what we're going to use is start to find areas where ai and these is a new tool for us i mean give an example of where i i think what ai has to do is how do you take a job and make it 10 times easier right and and you know and for example drive, doing going up to a drive through right now we have people to help you go through a drive through how do you make that such that ai can really take some of the mundane out of work so that we can do we don't have to work ourselves to death we just work as we are before we have a nice work environment we're doing 10 times as much work as we did before but it it doesn't feel any harder and how do you do that so i'll give you i'll give you real con one concrete example throughout the medical industry this is state of the art they have these jobs called a uh, abstractor i don't know if you heard what an abstractor does um but you get a degree and what you do is you your job is to you know go to let's say a medical a medical document and read it and then try to extract stuff that you can put into a database or do a sql query and there's hundreds of thousands of these people in in medicine and when i talked to them as well how do you do it and they and they're trying to piece this stuff together and i said have you ever tried to search they said well that's that's pretty hard you know because it it's it's not it's non it's not the uh, public information it's private information and so there's an area where ai can really help because before it's on the public information could we bring these technologies and if you look inside like let's say the, the google search engine we all use it all day long right and what's happening is you're searching for videos it it knows how to drop you right in the right part of the youtube video it can find the images for you that's a that's a pretty sophisticated machinery it's got a lot of ai baked in and we're looking at well how, where else could that be useful right and those and i think of if you think of that kind of a uh, mentality we do on the consumer side imagine that in business where you start to ask questions and now these tools are basically it's like a it's like a wrench it's like a typewriter it's like a microwave you know i think we were talking a lot about if you're building a microwave what's the physics and what's the regulation around the physics and how do you do this safely and all, there's a lot of stuff to build the microwave but everyone in business can go down the microwave throw a thing of popcorn in there and get popcorn as a snack right and i think we're we're getting to the point now where these these microwaves will be like these new ai technologies in business but it's going to be the mundane instead of having to be an abstractor and going through all these different documents by hand can't you just go ahead and just type in a search right and and things like that and so that's what um i'm i'm seeing a lot more of is just how do you actually bring ai into the business place so that we can do 10 times as much work it doesn't feel any different and we're, we're we're much more productive we have to we have to figure this out and so that's where i see like these things coming in and and a lot of things to think about ethics and and, and applicability absolutely just like we have regulated things in the in the microwave there's a whole community around how do you build a safe microwave we need to do that safely for an ai but when most people are going to use it it's going to feel like search right and it's going to be a natural tool because it's going to make a life a lot better and another example is you know we you type in gmail 
and you get an autocomplete of a sentence and it seems to know you. Well, yeah, it's a model for you. Well, why can't you just have and just extend it a little further and you want to draft an, an email or you want to draft slides and here you go. Here's 50 emails to all the people at your party last night. Now you can review them. You used to have to type those things by hand. Same thing for slides, same things for decks, same things for spreadsheets. Those are going to become question and answers to an AI system and then we're far more productive. And your, your kids are going to say, Mom, you used to really have to do, but put slides together for work? That seems so tedious. Who does that anymore? Right? So I think that's where we're going. We're not there yet, but that's the kind of thing we need to get this 10x improvement. Wonderful. So it's from I want to know to I want to know now to I want to buy or have that experience right now. So what a what a what an evolution that has come through us. Thank you, Scott, for your response on that. Uh, over to you, Yuga. What approach do you advise your customers to take as they implement AI solutions of their own? Yuga? Yeah, so I guess, you know, given the fact that AI is, is being touted as so transformational, many times uh, what we have seen is enterprises may go the other end. I mean, they, they may believe they have to do something so creative which they have never done, but some fundamentals uh, rarely ever change, right? So you still have the technology part of it, you still have a people part of it, and then of course you have a bigger process part of it. So these enablers continue to be important. How do you drive them may change? So for example, I think uh, Nidhi and Scott both, both talked about, one is what we call AI literacy. So first of all, the leadership in, the, uh, in an enterprise need to be aware and convinced about the value of AI. Otherwise, uh, the data I earlier shared, that will continue. People will keep on doing a lot of POC, a lot of small projects here and there and be done with it, but but that will be undermining the potential of AI. So getting that literacy of AI is extremely important. I believe we all spoke about the, the need for talent, of course, and then how AI can actually solve for that, that lack of time, right? The All the low code, no code developments that are there, can AI, and now we are also talking about AI generated code. So the point being, the lack of skill of AI can actually, to some extent, be solved with AI. It's a, it's a, it's a recursive loop, but, but I think that is how it is. In addition, some of the fundamentals around processes. Now, what does it mean uh, beyond your AI strategy? So, for example, business casing, why we are doing it, how we should do it, which use cases as an industry we need to prioritize. All of those things are important. But then what sort of org structure do we need? And what sort of operating model do we need as an, in, um, as an enterprise? There will be a lot of change management. Who is going to drive it? Will our current, let's say, our, our current organization uh, model is going to sustain? If you remember when digital transformation really started many years ago, many enterprises created a post for CDO, Chief Digital Officer. Now not many have them because they realize this kind of a model does not work. So what is the right organization structure? Will we see a you know, chief AI officer for that matter, CAIO? Uh, we see chief sustainability officer. Will there be a chief AI officer as well? Maybe, maybe not. So every enterprise will need to take their own bets around what works for them, what does not work for them. Last but not the least is the technology. And I think we have always assumed and always almost like belittled saying, okay, technology is always there. We can use it. It's not that simple. AI is a complex domain. Using the right tools, right platforms, right partners is extremely important. So which type of cloud platforms are you going to bet on? Which type of data platforms are you going to build? How you are going to remove biases from, from your data? How you are going to build a foundation? operationalize that foundation and then scale it. So all of those elements will need to come together for a customer AI journey to succeed. And I think it is going to be the usual, you know, uh, uh, crawl, walk and, and run kind of a model. But then every in enterprise will need to find its own way, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. Having said that, focus on internal organization structure, 
focus on the right technology bet and last but not the least have your leadership buy in your business case sorted ai literacy into the organization and then be willing to drive a lot of change management that's how at least we have seen some of the successful enterprises adopting ai at a reasonable scale wonderful uh, you got thank you so much over to you scott how will you rate the industry's adoption of ai on a scale of 1 to 10 with 1 being just starting to 10 where ai is fully embedded in a business's operating model and processes where do you see it going next scott um, i i think it's like me throwing darts at a bullseye in a bar i mean look, i think of like hitting all from 0 to 10 i think depends on who you talk to ej i mean you know what i'm finding more and more is that you know ai is a fascinating technology think of it you know, like even ai and quantum oh my gosh we actually get that running right but um where where it's really going to be pulled into business and fast is because a lot of these jobs that we used to have with minimal minimal wage right there's a lot of minimal wage jobs that people just aren't showing up for anymore you know reminded of like many many years ago a couple hundred years ago we used to all have to wake up in the morning and go slop the pigs and dig dench dig dig dirt and you know feed our food then go eat the food and then and there's a lot of farming jobs that just don't exist anymore for most families. I think I think now we're we're seeing it and it's a it's a step function change in a lot of retail, a lot of restaurants, a lot of other businesses where they say, "Oh, we're just going to hire someone, we'll pay them minimum wage, they'll do that job." You know, they need that job. And people aren't showing up for it. And so now you got to figure out, I got to run a restaurant with one waiter. How am I doing that? Right? And I said, "Well, maybe someone's going to figure out how to take a Roomba and put a dinner plate on it and send the Roomba out there, right? And that's a robot. No, it's just a Roomba with a dinner plate, right? So I mean, we're going to start to see innovation. Same thing for people that, you know, you do a drive up. Right now we we have minimum wage people there and you're seeing drive ups, you know, closing down. Why isn't that like a call center that you're talk, talking to, right? That, that, and I think we're going to see a lot of innovation pulling in saying, "Here's our tasks that humans just don't want to do anymore. How can we automate that task and change our process so that we can accommodate much fewer people and actually allow do the same process we had before. So I think we're seeing a lot of innovation in in the, in the retail, there's a lot of innovation in in the food industry, in the service industry where they're just people aren't showing up for those jobs. And we've got to figure out how to you know, to stay in business. Why well, tell you that there's nothing like that kind of pressure to figure out how do I bring in AI? How do I take a lot of this paperwork out and and use AI for that technique? And that's going to bring I think a rush of these technologies in as tools to make us sort of like superhuman in the sense of we now have these tools to let us do things before we had to use labor for that labor doesn't exist people don't want that job so i think it's going to force us to rethink that and we're seeing it now in droves you know just in your local hometown right we we like to go to the corner restaurant they can't find people same thing for a yoga retreat like how do you how do you do this so i think we're going to see tremendous innovation here in just the next few years now cuz people want to stay in business and they and there'll be entrepreneurs who are going to figure out a new way to do things where ai where you're reading you're writing you're you're seeing you're perceiving and those are technologies now that we didn't have just 5 years ago right and I, that's where i see a lot of this coming in and i think then that will help us think through like as you bring it in what are the ethics of this tool as it's been approved of course and all those issues that you guys bring bringing up now become as part of that tool this is a safe tool right and i think that's that's where i'm going to see an awful lot of innovation i'm already seeing it personally in these enterprises right as they go through these transformations So that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Sam. That's Scott. Uh I'm going to pick up some questions from the audience uh and I would leave it to the panel to decide on how you would like to respond and who would like to respond. Uh how do you see AI playing a role? This is from Sendin. How do you see AI playing a role in hyper-personalizing the customer experiences based on intelligent insights? hyper personalizing the customer experiences based on intelligent insights right i i think okay. you know i'll just put two cents in here you, you want to go on well, nate once you go first um okay um i i i just wanted to bring in a moment of uh, jest over here i wanted to say that uh, um I, AI um you know uh, and especially if you look at AI in a retail experience the way it is able to read your mind and predict your interest is sometimes getting even better than your spouse's ability to know what you want for your anniversary it is you know it, it's it's maturing to that level so it's it's scary also at times i would say but i i do think the uh 
if, if you look at the way how we have learned to shop in the last two years, we've, we've really embraced online shopping and it's going to be now an irreversible change, you know, to, to, to go back to my old uh, behaviors and the ability of the algorithm to remember what I was searching for, when I was searching for, and then to give me recommendations is uh, something because, uh, you know, it, that's where it is rivaling, you know, the human mind's ability to retain information and uh, <clears throat> leverage it. But I will say one thing, because I do want to hear from Scott as well, that we must remember, and this is my firm belief, AI will always be an extension to human intelligence. It will never be able to replace it. So so I, I, I think if, if we look at it from that standpoint, I think um, we, we are only experiencing hyper-personalization and we will begin to experience it more and more. Because just, you know, randomly in the middle of my work day, sometimes Uber Eats will tell me that, uh, you know, depending on my general food preferences, you know, a restaurant has a deal out there. Would I like to, uh, you know, order something? So it is uh, uncanny, interesting, but, you know, something that we all uh, will embrace a lot. So let's hear from Scott. Yeah, a, a couple of things are nitty. Uh, one is, you know, we do have superhuman technologies today that we buy. Like you can buy a superhuman thumb today at Home Depot. And a superhuman thumb is called a hammer, right? I mean, it's, it does far more than we ever could in a, in a finger, but we've gone from a rock to a hammer and it's pretty, and we can buy it for a couple of bucks and superhuman. I, I think we're gonna see uh, digital intelligence as a superhuman capability, but it's a tool, just like a hammer, right? And, we're, and, you're, and you just pointed to one area with it is shopping. Right now, we still we still browse, we look, we shop, but you you can probably see uh, indications of the trend where it's starting to know really well what you want. So why don't you flip it? So at some point, why don't you just say, just ship me what I need, I'll return what I don't want. And so now we're having robots that are being programmed to go. It looks like a beer cooler with wheels and an antenna, and it goes there. And his job is to go pick up stuff that you don't want. And so at some point, does e-commerce flip? And now you, 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 you have a provider that knows you well. And that's where you're seeing it with clothing. We're seeing very early versions with clothing. If you buy some, why not subscribe? Get a 10% discount because they, they have annuity net streams from you now because they know that's what you want. And so it's in their commercial's best interest because they can't hire the salespeople. No one wants to stand up for 10 hours a day in retail anymore, right? They don't want to answer the phone. So why not just ship from the warehouse to you? And if you're an annuity stream, there's a, there's a financial incentive to get it right. And that'll be a superhuman ability to understand what you need, but it flips e-commerce with a lot less labor. Right? It's just one example of this where the idea of personalization, understanding who you are, a lot of times when we, we do this at Google, we step back and saying, do we really want to deploy this? And we go through the whole thing. We, we, we look at the ethics of it, the privacy of everything else. A lot of times we don't even do that, that metric because it's just, it, it's a creepy factor. We don't, we don't put it in. And so what you want to do is figure out what's right for the customer. But I think the ability to understand patterns and what your behavior is showing versus what you think it is showing. No wonder it's, it may know what's better for, you know, rec recommending for your anniversary. Like you want to give them a birthday present for your daughter. And like, what do I get for a 12 year old? How about this? Their friends are doing it. Oh, that's pretty cool. What if it shipped you a week ahead of time with the wrapping you've liked and pre wrapped Like that'd be amazing. Right. And so I think that's what we're starting to see. And that'd be one innovation driven by, we can't find people to stand up 15 hours and wait around in a shoe store anymore. What do you do? Brilliant. Uh, you got your thoughts? No, I think most of these things are are covered. You know, hyper personalization, as Nithi also said. As an end user, it sometimes scares me. Yeah, you know, okay, what what the heck is going on? But at the same time, <laughs> uh, businesses know that this is needed. But the interesting aspect of AI will be it will allow you to do it at in a in a scale manner so you know what is called mass personalization or hyper personalization at scale otherwise as a business you cannot keep chasing individual as your target segment so but you will create your strategies and then use use ai to target individuals around okay this is where personalization is needed and this is where personalization is not needed because many times human beings want to be part of a cohort so the AI system need to understand when the when this person will be a part will prefer to be a part of the cohort versus 
an individual who needs to be served individually, if I may say so. But of course, AI has a has a very interesting and an important role to play. Otherwise, we won't be able to do it. I think it's as simple as that. Brilliant. So, in the process of, uh, uh, I've seen plethora of choice architects coming up to influence the decision making process of consumers. So, brilliantly said. Thank you for sharing your opinion. Uh, I have a question from uh, uh, Avimanu. It's on, in, on biases. Since AI learned from our past knowledge facts which might have positive and negative issue biases, how do we formulate a system to detect and minimize the biases, specifically in the criminal justice system? Who would like to go first? Should I repeat the question? OK. On biases. I think that's a question that's AI... not very clearly. <laughs> Yes, yes, I agree. Oh, and we will Scott? only take Scott's view for this one. There are lots of yes, questions, okay. so we'll try and get through as many as we can. Yeah, lots of questions. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so I think it's here, going back to me, it's, it comes back to data and understanding really the origins of data and, um, and just how careful we have to be with it. So there's a very famous um, article in the last decade about recidivism. Right? What's the chances of this potential person, they're, they're going to come back to jail, right? And um, and they used to give recidivism scores, and and what was what we're finding is that these things were highly biased. And you to talk to the the math nerds behind this, said, "What do you mean? I, I'm not putting anything in there about your background, about your racial um, background, but you look at the questions, and the questions and the data they were collecting was you know collected as a as a whole. Like, what zip code were you from? Do you know anyone who's been shot in these, in these other areas? And if you look at that statistically, that's a tell for a particular demographic." Right. And, and they were using that demographic. It's just like another very famous study in AI where it was an amazing, uh, like a 99 percent fit of detecting breast cancer. And they said, well, why is this so good? We've been doing this for years. It's not so great between two hospitals. And you did an analysis of where the model was thinking and you realized it was zooming in the lower part of the picture. Like what's going on in the X-ray? And it turns out it was looking at the serial number of the X-ray machine. <laughs> if it came from an inner city versus another city or a different location, it was saying, if, it, if it's close, just call it cancer. And they're like, that's not what we want. So, because AI in some sense is lazy, it finds the pattern. Just be careful what you ask for. And so what that means is as you're going through it, that's why a lot of times we have um, new AI products. AI just amplifies our own biases. That's I mean, we have to function with bias. It's how we don't go crazy. It's called, you know, like, what do we focus on? Because there's all these sounds going around, that, you know, how, how your socks feel on your feet, how your shoes feel on your feet. Probably thinking about that now. How's the chair against your left arm? Thinking about that now. You weren't before. Your brain has to bias against all information and focus on something so you don't go crazy. So what happens is, like, um, Nitty, what she's focusing on, and Vijay, what you're focusing on, you go focusing on, we're all different. And so we come together, you go, well, says, I know what the answer is. I said, well, what's the answer? And he goes, it's as big as a wall and you can't move. It's an immobile thing. I'm like, really? And Vijay's like, no, it's not. It's bushy. It's bushy and it's easy to move. And then he's like, what are you talking about? It's big and flappy. It's like, a, I don't know, it's like a big piece of leather. We're all talking about an elephant, right? Because we've all basically looked at our own biases. And AI is a technology where if you're going to ship something, you've got to have people with different backgrounds with different biases at the table and then collectively, you can look at it and then say, oh, I see what you mean. You shouldn't ask for zip code. Have you been shot? And do you know anyone who's been in jail? Because that's just that's a tell for a particular demographic. Get those questions off. Right. But you, you, that will only come out if you're with people don't have the same biases as you do. It's almost guaranteed if you if you look at an AI team and all the same background, that product's going to be biased and they're not going to see it because we all have hidden biases. And so I think that's where a lot of this comes out is that, you know, it's a really good, really good question. It's sort of the, you know, the trolley issue in self-driving cars, you know, a trolley's coming across, how do you stop? You know, someone's going to have to die. Um, these may be artificial scenarios, but it comes down to if we're shipping a product, um, how do you then make sure that you have, and, and we try to reveal these biases we have as human beings, right? And the algorithm itself is also biased that like we talked about for the breast cancer or civism. It'll find the pattern, right? Just be careful what pattern it finds. Right? And as you do, how do we evaluate the pattern so that is it bushy? Is it a wall? Is it a flappy leather thing? No, it's an elephant. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Ashish has a question. In healthcare, 
we are seeing a significant use of AI. However, in US, we are still seeing it limited in limited use in the area of medical diagnosis. Do you agree? And when do you think it will be mainstream? Yeah, I, I mean, it's been the last couple of years with uh, AI and healthcare. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want anywhere near a di diagnosis, right? So in the sense that AI is a tool, just like, just like an x-ray machine, just like anything else. It's a very powerful tool, and it's really good for helping caregivers get to the right information at the right time, right? So think of you're going in, you're going for help, and you're saying, like, how do I, what's going on with me? That, you know, how do, and they only see you for five minutes, seven minutes. How do you make that really productive for that doctor? And how do you get the information she needs at her fingertips so she can make a better decision? Right. So can you use AI as a technique to say there's all these latest re reports, all these latest new treatment you know, that are posted, all these new drug trials um, and new information coming out. And she's just a rural doctor in Missouri. How do you get her the information she needs at that time so you can have a better diagnosis and treatment? Like was the inner city, Philadelphia. You can't afford to go to the doctor. You know, the parking thirty five dollars. You don't have thirty five dollars. So how do you how do you do telemedicine and how do you use that, which is like, again, video and information? where AI is now assisting the doctor, right? And where the doctor makes a decision, but it's sort of like having, you know, the physician's desk reference and be able to search through that instantaneously to help the doctor in her decision-making, right? That's where I see a lot. And AI has made you know, that mistake very early on, the very early AI, when I went to school um, at MIT, we were studying symbolic AI long before deep learning. And it's very classic systems where they try to use AI as a direct diagnosis. And because there's so many subtle things in one of the most complex systems in the, in the world, our bodies, our bodies are amazing machines. They repair themselves. I mean, wouldn't that be great if your car did that? But it doesn't, right? So in order to understand that, we need to have the human element. But how do we use AI as a tool to help her make those decisions better by getting the right information at the right time? I think that's where we're going to see a lot of AI. And AI may have an indication of these areas are interesting on a, on a scan to look at. Why don't you take a look at those? as opposed to, oh, that you definitely have a polyp in your, colon, in your colon. These areas you might want to take a look at and have the doctor then decide, right? That's where we're seeing a real effective use of AI in healthcare. And a lot of it comes down to things like just scheduling nurses. You know, how do, how do you know, you know, what, what nurse and how do you, and can you use like some basic math to help nurses, you know, find a job and, and, and make, make the job less stressful. So that's where I see AI in medicine an awful lot. I think what gets a lot of the press are, you know, the diagnostics, um, there's something we're doing at Google, which is not only can AI read what's in your blood, it's basically a company like Grail or Oxford Nanopore, using AI to basically understand what's in your blood, we can now predict the structure of those things using AI, and we have a company called Isomorphic Labs. But that's assisting in drug design. But it's not designing the drug, it's helping the drug designer do a better job. And I think that what we're finding is really taking a lot, getting a lot of traction not in what we first read about is like, wow, it can diagnose a breast cancer, it can diagnose these things. That's a really interesting pattern recognition. But in practice, let the doctor make the decision, right? Put this in her hands and use it as a tell for her information. Yeah, um, uh, very, very good insight, Scott. And uh, Ashish, the point I will make is that this is the industry where we will see a lot of AI being used in the next few years. And uh, uh, some of it, you, you, you would have seen that telemedicine became a real thing in, in the mm -hmm. last two years. And, and prior to that also, telemedicine was available, but uh, I would just feel more confident having met the physician in person at the GP's office. Uh, so, but, you know, the trust was built. The, the other thing uh, that uh, I, I will say uh, where uh, I, I think... Uh, uh, AI will have a huge role to play in um, healthcare is that uh, as the technologies, you know, as cloud and, and uh, um, you know, uh, the, the ability to do slicing and dicing of data becomes more and more affordable, you will see a big uptick uh, in um, the technologies being consumed by healthcare, whether it's by doctors or uh, um, uh, you know, whether you're doing uh, uh, scans of x-rays looking for cancers, and even in personalized drug uh, design for uh, patients. I think it is a few years away, maybe anywhere between three to five, but it is coming. 
and uh, I, I think this is an industry which is poised very well. Retail has used it. Banking has used it. They will continue to use. But healthcare is poised for the growth, is, is my view. Wonderful. Uh, I think uh, the, this is an amazing audience. The kind of questions that are pouring in are difficult to be handled in this short span of time. So I would request the audience to be patient. We will respond offline with the, from the panel side. So I would have one question that I had in mind that I would like to ask. And I would like to ask uh, uh, all the three panel members, beginning with uh, Yugal, then possibly Scott, and then Nidhi. So the question is, uh, what, what lies ahead for AI? Maybe a minute each, please, starting with Yugal. So I think... What uh... lies ahead for yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so I guess adoption, maybe cautious adoption, but definitely an adoption, um, and and using AI as it permeates different part of our lives, our work and social fabric. So that will continue. You know, I think it's a it's a one way street, much like cloud wars. And to be fair, AI has been around like forever, uh, and but but has not got the needed push from the required building blocks, which are probably now, and they are further evolving. So I'm, I'm quite confident and hopeful that going forward, enterprises and consumers like us are going to adopt AI a lot more strategically and, and, and be more willing to trust AI more than probably what we do now. Thank you, Yugal. One minute, Scott. What lies ahead? You know. What lies ahead for AI? You know, um, yeah. I want to see it to be as easy as search, where you know there's a there's ten thousand people who are really good at it, and they're designing all these algorithms and they think very thoughtfully through it. But it's the kind of thing where you know I would love a world where you're an enterprise and you say, well, I got all this data. I said, okay, well, let's get that data ready. We'll put it into a data site like a website, and maybe TCS helps you build that, right? You got a data site. Okay, we'll pick a surface. Well, do you want to talk to it? Do you want an API put in your process? Do you want to you want to chat with it? Do you want to just search and have a panel come up? Well, you we pick a surface and then ask away, right? And then the idea is that can you look at a business process and say, where do I need information at my fingertips? Because I don't have the labor to do it anymore, right? That I can make my decision. And that to me is, is a wonderful future. And, you know, I think our CEO talked about the future of, of, uh, of Google and, you know, and AI and search. I'm like, what? I think we're talking about how do you apply that technology? It's rich in AI, but to, to, to basically help solve IR problems, information retrieval problems in business, and they're everywhere. And I think that we're going to start to use AI. And if you can Google, you can use AI. That's where I see it going. Brilliant. Nidhi, over to you. What lies ahead yeah. for AI? Uh, my perspective is very bullish. I think we will uh, see um, a lot of AI. Uh, we will also see... Um, uh, new uh, new businesses, new offerings, and new jobs. And uh, we will see some jobs being sunset as well. Um, uh, for, for example, I'll, I'll give you Uber Eats as an example. So we have what was originally a transportation offering from Uber, and uh, we had the restaurant business, and how the two came together to create a new offering. So I expect to see a lot more blurring of lines, learning, cross-pollination between industries because of the digital front the business will have. So your ability to share data, your ability to share insights and then build something um, as trust and collaboration builds. It won't happen, um, you know, the, the forces of business and economics and uh, consumer forces will be there, but I, uh, I, I see that. And I, I see uh, AI alleviating uh, human beings from doing a lot of repetitive jobs. Those are the jobs that the machine will take over, just like there were lots of jobs taken over by the machine, uh, by, by the by, you know, the industrialization Industrial. that we have seen uh, during our history. So, so you, yes, machines will take our jobs away. So, and yes, so will machine learning. But we have to be prepared for it. But and but at the end of the day, human mind. Human intelligent intelligence trumps artificial intelligence. So I still see uh, that uh, it's. Uh, I have an optimistic view uh, of the future with AI. 
and I hope to get Wonderful. into a driver car. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. This has been a great discussion. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Our thought leaders uh, have presented a framework for a comprehensive approach to scale AI adoption, along with how to drive innovation. Yugal shared his insights on how enterprises adopt AI and ML and are weaving into their core businesses about ethics in AI. Yugal shared his perspective on the topics of explainability and bias as AI becomes mainstream, on challenges that enterprises face while navigating through their AI adoption journey. Nidhi gave her insights on ways to overcome some of the most common ones. Nidhi also succinctly uh, outlined along with Scott and Yugal on what lies ahead for AI. This has been a wonderful audience that has shared uh, a lot of questions and uh, we're going to get back offline. And Scott, of course, talked about Google technologies increased in use as customers transform their businesses. He shared his perspective on a framework for AI-led business transformation and his assessment on the industry's adoption of AI and on where it is heading. Thank you, Yugal, Nidhi, Scott, for the wonderful discussion and for sharing your rich insights with us. Thank you so much, uh, dear audience. To learn how TCS and Google Cloud can help you embrace cloud for purpose-led, sustainable growth, contact gbu.marketing at tcs.com. With that, we will bring today's session to a close.